are recording this um, a workshop as well because we'll be putting it up on the council web page too. So this is a first, um, our first workshop of a series um, of workshops on well-being and encouraging businesses, organisations, and employers in Wandsworth to think about their workplace well-being, whether it's putting in healthy workplace initiatives or what that means. And so that's partly what this first series is about. Um, Greg is also um, Greg is also um, online today. Um, he did start sharing t with us about Supply Wandsworth. Um, there is a consultation going on, but I'll, I'll pass that on to Greg. So Greg can introduce that and then um, we'll go into the workshop. Um, thank you, Nadal. Uh, look, guys, I hope you can hear me properly. And, and if you can't, please, um, you know, put it in the chat or scream at me that you can't hear me. Um, but just as Nadal was saying, so I am also part of Wandsworth. I am delivering a program called Supply Wandsworth. Um, it seems a little bit odd. It seems a little bit out of place, but hopefully I can explain why I am here. Um, Supply Wandsworth is a strategy delivered by the borough to ensure that local businesses in the borough are in a position to bid for public sector and private sector um, tender and tender contracts. Um, one of the things that are is in very important that has become highly important within the process of bidding for a contract is showcasing your your company's social value and commitment to social value and health and well-being. Um, and so what's beginning to happen is that there is a bigger focus on ensuring that your company has some workplace standards, some health and well-being standards, um, some social value standards embedded into your company. Uh, myself and Nadal have been working together to build, to create a consultation um, which is currently online and I will share within the chat. Um, and this consultation, this consultation fundamentally will do that. What we're looking and hoping to do is canvas a range of businesses in the borough, try to understand what their learning and support needs are in terms of becoming supplier ready, but also in terms of embedding some of those practices infrastructure policies and procedures that are necessary um, so as you know so things like healthy workplace standard um, you know living I, I guess uh, living employers etc etc um, or healthy employers etc etc so they're the kind of things that we are trying to understand and learn from businesses the survey it will give us an answer and an idea of where businesses are in terms of their own journey and how we can potentially offer a support um, via things like webinars like this or kind of face-to-face -face training consultations and Thanks. yes yeah the survey yeah. is in the chat Thanks so much, Gregory. That was really good um, sort of summary of all of that. And and that's partly as well what we'd like to learn today as well is what businesses, what would be helpful and useful for businesses to push support for healthy workplaces as well. So let's, without further ado, I'll pass it on to Nuz, who's from, she'll, she'll say where she's from and give a little introduction, but she's um, de delivering the workshop today. So I'll pass it on to her. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, and it's great to be here. I'm just getting myself uh, organized so that we can we can kick off. Um, so my name is Nur Shagan. Um, I work as, um, well, twofold, uh, a workplace well-being strategist. Um, I have a background working for an organization uh, such as IKEA. I was the head of health and well-being for the UK and Ireland. Uh, so I think I know a thing or two about uh, workplace well-being. But also at the at the same time, I also have worked with startups. I've worked with small to medium to large organizations, looking at um, at the well wellbeing strategies and what does it actually mean? What does wellbeing mean in the context of where we are today? Um, and what is it that we we need to be doing to be able to um, really get ahead uh, of of the curve in in terms of the work that we're doing? Um, so just bear with me while I just um, move on to some, some slides and then uh, I'll be able to give you a bit of an introduction in terms of where we, where we are. Um, just bear with me. 
not wanting me to share for some reason. It was all working before. Technical hint glitches as they normally do. Um, let me just add a pin and remove that pin. Um, also, just to say, please do use the chat to introduce yourself, um, to be able to, uh, you know, to tell us a little bit of about who you are, where you come from, because that's really essential that we we have that uh, as well to hand. Um, so please do do use the chat uh, chat function as well. I'm just waiting to share and just someone could let me know as soon as uh, you can see my screen. That would be very helpful because. Um, yeah, that's come up. I right. think you're on the last slide. Yeah, yeah. Let's just go to the top slide. Okay. Um, so kicking kicking off, uh, as I said, um, we'll just go through a bit of an agenda so you you are a bit more aware of what we're going to be covering today. Um, we'll do a bit of a welcome and introduction to let's improve workplace well-being. Um, as I said, a short introduction to myself and and my background. Uh, defining what well-being means, um, and that's really essential for all of us here, just to get everyone's input, because this isn't just about, uh, you know, one size fits all, you know, we know everything, there, there is about collaboration yeah, and co-creation, so that's quite important. Um, what does well-being include today? So that's going beyond, you know, it was really good that Greg gave his introduction, and many of you must be thinking, or if you don't know, is what does well-being have to do with environmental social governance, uh, which is what ESG stands for, by the way, um, but also in terms of the supply chain, you know, we're talking about procurement, what is the relationship between the two? So we'll be we talking a little bit about what well-being includes today. We'll also be talking a, a lot around why well-being makes commercial sense. So then touching a lot on what um, Gregory has spoken about as well. And then how does well-being impact, you know, people, communities and business? Um, so again, referring to this whole life cycle of if you are a business today, wanting to go a little bit further, wanting to bid for for business within the public or the private sector, you need to be thinking about well-being and how that actually works within your organization. Um, it's about that brand perception. It's about how it works. Um, and more and more, we are moving the curve uh, on well-being, not just being a nice to do, but rather a really a, a good way of, of moving um, forward a business looking forward. Uh, we'll do some Q&A and some next steps. So just a little bit about Let's Improve Workplace Wellbeing. It's a non-for-profit uh, community interest company. Uh, it means that the company is not designed to make profits. Uh, we exist in order to generate um, this working together. We come together as a community of heads of health and well-being from all sorts of sizes of organizations. We've got anyone from head of health and well-being at Hayes to, um, you know, Ann Summers and everything in between. So both public and private sector. Um, and the aim is really to learn and share from best practice. And this is the reason why um, I work on the leadership team. Um, and we are able to come and present in terms of this, because what we are doing is generating all of these learnings uh, from all different companies and then bringing it together um, to see how the agenda can move a little bit more forward. Um, at the end of the presentation, I do have uh, some important links which I'll be able to share and one of them is around Let's Improve Workplace Wellbeing um, if you are interested to learn more uh, and also some details of myself and uh, of Wandsworth um, Council as well. So really key um, kind of uh, links that you'll be able to look at. So moving on, I think, um, as I said, we really want to use the chat um, to get your thoughts and your ideas. Um, you know, we are a small group, so there is a bit of that time to be able to really think about it. So in the first instance, before I regurgitate uh, a, a kind of a, a well-being definition, if you like, or what it entails, I wanted to get some of your thoughts. So please use the chat or to add in, or if someone wants to put their hand up, what do you think... Um, well-being means to business today what, what what do you think it entails why is it important any takers please do use the chat it's the best way to just get people engaged and that anything nadal for example what, yeah, what's your, well, oh, well, lucinda yeah, yeah there we go sorry we yeah go. absolutely we that. well yeah. i mean well-being is is actually not just reserved for business i mean it is a it's a it's a it's a home 
business, work, life, uh, family balance, and one will inevitably impact the other. And if you are finding anything in your life, either slightly anxious making or stressful making, it will leach into the other. And companies have, have an ability, because we spend so much time there, um, have an ability to support and help their staff in many, many ways uh, of, 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 of as, as we grow in age um, and, and our circumstances change. And, and it's part of looking after your staff, um, I think, both emotionally and physically, that it's important that, that and I'm glad that it's now being addressed. It's also tax free, as far as I remember, when I looked into this before, it's an tax free advantage to the companies to 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 actually help and provide well being for their staff. Okay, Gregory, you've got your hand up. Did you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, I, I probably was going to second Lucinda. I sort of like when I think about well being, I think about um, sort of like emotional, physical, mental, spiritual health all rolled into one. Yeah. Um, and then how, again, second in what Lucinda said is how if one is off balance, it kind of creates an even, it creates, it makes everything else off balance. Mm -hmm. So from a workplace perspective, from a, from a home life perspective and from a personal perspective, it's almost about trying to align maybe all of those kind of four things together in some way, shape or form. Mm hmm. No, that's good. And then also really in the chat, it's uh, Carla, thank you. It's looking after staff, mental health, fair pay, work-life balance, which is really good. Um, and then also, uh, I'm, I'm just going to refer to the Iron Lady at Gatehouse because, as I said, I, lo I love the name. Wellbeing is taking care of your physical, mental and social health. So we are all on the right track. As I said, the, there's no one definition. It's a com combination of all that we're speaking about. It's not to say one is right, one is wrong. We are all on a learning curve. So this is essentially what, what we're talking about. What we've kind of looked at in terms of what a, a well-being, if you like what it encompasses, is, is really about well-being is an ethos um, it, and a commitment to creating a healthier, happier, uh, and more productive workforce. So really, essentially, it's not only about the workforce. It's also about community. It's about the world. And we're no longer just thinking about well-being being just uh, – only centrically us ourselves, although, yes, exactly as Lucinda said, it's important as an individual, but also when we talk about workplace well-being, which is the focus for today, it is really up to the leaders within organizations to focus on empowering and creating the conditions for employees um, to thrive and be well personally, professionally, physically, and financially. So really encompassing a lot of what everybody has said here. Unfortunately, we still have a debate regarding does well-being really make a difference? And essentially what we're saying today is the answer is yes. We know that for a fact, the more well people are, the more chances are they will thrive. And when they thrive, businesses thrive. And when businesses thrive, the environment can thrive because people who are happy and healthy treat people around them better and also treat the environment much better. And this is where we're seeing a lot of this intersectionality or this moving together of the parts uh, as we seem. Once upon a time, it seemed very disjointed. It was in silo. You had diversity and inclusion in one side, you had well-being on one side, and then you had sustainability on the one side. What we're saying is it all comes together and we need to be thinking of it. Um, well-being is also if I feel a sense of belonging, if I feel a sense of belonging to a purpose and I see that, then the chances are I will be more engaged and more productive. So that's essentially what we're saying. So I'm not necessarily saying this is the absolute um, you know, definition and, and everything, but it's it's often more than like it encompasses a lot of this. So moving on, um, we're going to put up a poll because, again, this is all about getting people, um, you know, engaged in the conversation rather than us. So I'm going to launch that poll um, now. Um, so let me just relaunch it. Okay, so just tell me when everybody can see that. Um, as you said, there's no right or wrong answers. It's just what do you think well-being includes today? So these are 
not necessarily what should be there, what are there, what anything. It's more to get a bit of your understanding of what do you think in well-being includes today. And these are just some of the examples. I can assure you the list goes on and on, but for a starter for 10, it's a good indication of what people think well-being includes today. So you can put as many as you want. It's not just one, one answer. Um, it's, a, it's a number of them. Um, if anybody doesn't know what an employee assistance program is, I don't want to assume people know, it's usually a, a service provided by uh, organizations where people can access um, the opportunity to speak to someone about their mental health. It usually involves uh, some time with a psychologist, often six sessions, um, to be able to to talk through your um, where you are at. So it, it's more psychological uh, support. Uh, EAPs also extend and have a lot more to offer. It's not just the, the opportunity to speak to a, a, a psychologist or, or someone that can support you with your mental health. Um, they are expanding their offerings, but uh, yeah, often employee assistance programs are what organizations are using at the moment. Um, so I'm going to end the poll there and I'm just going to share some results. So it's interesting to see what people are, are thinking of. So it's great to see that well-being and what it should include or what you think it should include and what it does include today is employee support networks. Many of you thought that that was quite crucial and that is really important as we go along and we have this conversation as to what it all includes, why that is really vital. Today we know we are in a cost of living crisis. We know that it's quite difficult at the moment in terms of well-being budgets. We know that it's it's hard to pull some of that through because of, of where we are. And businesses are not any different to the individual at home trying to make ends meet. So we are aware of that. What it is around workplace well-being, or well-being in general, is you don't need the big budgets. There's a lot of resource that's available. There's a lot of the ability to pull together and really be able to take the conversations. And the first part is just showing that commitment um, with anything. And usually when we look at employee support networks, it's actually asking people what do they need. There's no point in bringing in some of uh, the initiatives and some of the big things if you've not actually spoken to your people and asked them what they think should be included for well-being in your organization. It's really essential to educate and guide people, but of course, this is what we're saying is that there's some things that, of course, from a legal perspective, you know, we know clinical support needs to be there, health assessments, etc. But with some of the things, it's starting small and not trying to think, oh, I need to implement a, a great big mental health first aider program, which is a, a big cost of the business. How do you start small? How do you educate and people within the organization to start opening up and trusting uh, the process? I'm going to stop this one and then I'm going to ask a, a couple of um other questions just to, to gauge what people think. So this question here is also, do you use any early intervention methods to reduce absences today out of interest? Um, no, yes, some yes, some no. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll there and I'm just gonna share what the answers are. So today, yep majority of people probably don't use any early intervention methods to reduce absence. Now, when we talk about early intervention methods, they don't need to, again, have all the frills, etc., of what you think it is. Sometimes it just starts out by having an understanding of how to take a conversation. I think often more than likely when people have been absent and they return to work, I think often how do you take that, that conversation? I refer to the fact that I've been a, a head of health and well-being. I've worked as a well-being strategist. But I've also led teams. Um, and today I work not only as a workplace well-being strategist within a business, um, but I also head up people and projects. And with that comes how do I take conversations, sometimes the most difficult conversations when people have had a lot of episodes of absence. And I can tell you hand on heart on the teams that I've dealt with, and I'm sure you've encountered this, when you take a one-to-one -one conversation and you break down some of the barriers, you find out actually what is leading them to be either late to work or, or absent. What is the underlying cause for some of the absence? It's not always straightforward that I've got the flu or it's been symptoms of COVID or we can actually see how much stress, the underlying stress uh, around for example, financial well-being because of the, the current state that we're in, or, you know, my children are off at the moment from school, I don't have enough money, how do I actually cope with them, but also cope with work? So you start seeing some of these 
kind of trends and things. So where it is, it's about taking those conversations. And this is where it's quite um, vital. Um, so as I said, many of you said 75%. And this is just out of interest for us to actually see where people are at. And then the last question that we wanted to, to look at is um, this one here. I don't know if you can see it. Have you created an environment where staff feel comfortable coming forward with well-being issues? It's one of the things that we see a lot of the time. Um, I don't know if it's launching for anyone. Can everybody see that question on Nadal? Can you see it? No. Uh, it didn't seem to want to um, let me stop sharing that one. Let me launch this one. So this one is, have you created an environment where staff feel comfortable coming forward with well-being issues? One of the key things we see are people are not necessarily comfortable. Um, it's taking that conversation. It's often leaders leading by example. It's about how do you create that atmosphere of trust where people don't feel that they'll be judged. So I'm going to end the poll there and again, share the results. And often, more than likely, it's really positive to see at least you know, 67% or well, two out of three have said that this is what they, they do have. There is that atmosphere that has been created. We know we've learned an exceptional amount from the way um, the pandemic has impacted our lives. We've seen what we've learned from it. I guess I'd like to take the positive spin of what the pandemic has taught us. It's brought forward the conversations around well-being, the importance of not only our individual well-being, as in how do I take care of myself, but it's also really shown us um, that well-being is here and it needs to be addressed and how it fits into the bigger commercial um, perspective of, of where we are. So I'm going to stop sharing those polls and move on just to share a bit around what we see today in terms of workplace well-being. Again, lots of these things are called different names. Um, however, this is encompassing quite a lot. We we started at the, at the start talking about what we think include is included in well-being today, but these are some of the things I wanted to just go through and, and kind of give you a, a little bit of an understanding of, of what there is. And I'm, I'm sure we'll open up for some discussion as well. So where we are at today with workplace well-being, and I'm going to leave subjective well-being and civil engagement towards the end, just to gauge if everybody knows what that is, but also to explain it in more detail. So today we talk about income and wealth, cost of living crisis, it's looking at how can you actually support your, your workforce today? Do they understand the basics of money management? Do they understand their financials? You know, um, we talk a, a lot at the moment around financial well-being. Um, what access is there to support? And there's a tremendous amount of, of support out there. So if you are a workplace at the moment that's, that's on this call, for example, there's loads of resources we can provide which are free, which you can allow your, your people to actually go out and, and find out. Another thing is around the, the living wage employer. It's really essential that, you know, with the current climate that we're in, is your organization in that position where they're supporting people from a, a well-being perspective financially? Um, we can't necessarily always move pay to the level that we would like it to be, um, but there is the support because it's about learning to live within your means um, and getting that element. So we, we talk about income and wealth. Um, we talk about work and job quality, which is quite essential. You know, if people are not feeling engaged with the work that they're doing, if they don't feel they have this purpose, they don't feel like they have the, the values and their values align with the work that they're doing, more than likely their job quality will be quite low. And we talk about productivity in this. We talk about presenteeism. How often are, are people really engaged with, the, with, with what they're doing? We talk about housing. Um, you know, things around that are in terms of, do I have a, a safe place to live? What is it like where I live? And it's quite important to understand people's situations because again, this impacts work. Um, I think Lucinda said a really good point. You know, we spend so much of our lives at work and more and more we are coming to the workplace to work. So we're bringing all of that with us. It's not that we, we can just leave it at the door like it was once upon a time that leave all your worries at the door, this is work and, and the two don't come together, they do. So it's essentially around that. We talked at length around health um, and this covers and encompasses quite a lot when we talk about physical and emotional well-being as well, um, as well as, as mental health. I think when we, we talk about health, we can just look at the, the current situation. If we're looking at where councils are looking at the moment, 
there's a couple of factors, and, and this is driven by a, a recent report, which is called the Covenant for Health, which is driven by a, a team of um, Westminster uh, MPs from all uh, the major parties, where they're actually talking about if we do not tackle within the next five to 10 years, the issues we've got around obesity, around smoking, around drinking, around um, mental health, in particular, young people's mental health, um, because of course, they are the future for tomorrow, the workforce that we are going to be relying on, then we will have potentially lots of problems. We know that, um, you know, the current state that the NHS is under, the strain that they're under, what can we be looking at that we're more preventative rather than reactive. And this all trickles down when we talk about it's not just about employers and businesses, it's also about government. And this is where government are taking a focus on it and what does it mean. But also when we look and extend to communities, if we look at the community of Wandsworth, how are we supporting health in the community? And I'll come on to a little bit about that when I touch on civil engagement. We talk about knowledge and skills, tools to do the job. Do I feel like I am able to develop myself? Am I able to develop my career? Am I moving forward? And this is why it's important for someone to feel like they are moving along um, or, or gaining more of that, that knowledge. Environmental quality, we talk about environment because, of course, we're talking about air quality. Um, it's many of the reasons why we, you know, if you look at some of the direction and the initiatives, it's all around how can we actually create better environment quality so people can walk to work or cycle to work or um, are able to actually walk to work without feeling that it's unsafe. So there's a lot around that. As I said, I'll come back to subjective well-being. We talk about safety. There's safety in the workplace. Do I have the tools to do my job? Can I do it in a safe way? We talk about, you know, some of the issues we've got around musculoskeletal um, issues. If you sat at your desk a lot of the time, what does that mean? But safety also extends now not just to physical safety, but psychological safety. Do I feel safe at work to be the person that I am? Uh, am I accepted? Am I included? Do I feel that sense of belonging? So a lot of that safety is not just physical, but also psychological. Um, Carla, you, you pointed out work-life balance. This is essential nowadays. It's, you know, how do you create as leaders, as, as teams, as middle managers, how do you create that balance between people's work and life balance? Because essentially more and more people are looking at, and the pandemic has driven a lot of that. It's questioning what is actually my work-life balance. Social connection, again, something that the pandemic has given us. It's that awareness around how vital it is as, as humans that we need social contact. Um, loneliness was a, a really big thing that came out of um, the pandemic, of how essential it is to have these connections, to be able to feel safe, to, to be able to have conversations, to feel like you're part of a, a wider group of, of people and, and connect with people. So we know that's really important as well. And then I'm going to come on to subjective well-being and civil engagement. So does anyone or has anyone heard of those two, subjective well-being and civil engagement? Any takers on those? You've probably referred to it, but not probably in the same term as calling it subjective. I'll, di I'll dive into it. But nonetheless, Gregory, this is what you probably spoke around and so did listen. It's about that emotional side. It's really defined as a person's cognitive and effective evaluation of his or her life It's uh, or their lives. Um, it's that what I think in life uh, about my life satisfaction. It talks, it's very emotive. It, it talks a lot around life as a whole. Um, and it refers to your relationships. Uh, your emotional connection, it refers to your your moods, your feelings, you know, um, are they pleasant or are they positive? You know, am I angry? Do I feel elation? Do I feel joy? That's what subjective well-being is. And often, more than likely, when we talk about well-being, I've actually come across a lot of it. And perhaps, Lucinda, you've, you've possibly seen it more in the line of work that you're doing, is we don't often take this conversation around emotional well-being and it's quite essential when we think of about how it is important to an individual it, it drives them we can't say that it's disconnected people feel guilt they feel anger they feel shame and more than likely when you're taking conversations especially with adults nowadays it's they I often I often have to say to my team use your words you know what are you are you frustrated are you angry are you sad 
it's no point in saying I'm meh, you know, that's a classic kind of question that I'm okay. Um, let's dig deeper. Uh, what what does it mean? So Lucinda, did you want to say something? I, I mean, all of that resonates. I mean, you know, we, we, so much of what I, I come across is things that people are struggling with and, and they go back to how we were treated and taught how to react to life when we were little. But it comes to do with self-confidence, self-esteem, imposter syndrome, am I good enough? Um, there are so many other things. You know, if, if, if everything is going well and um, everything is smooth, then, you know, of course, we don't or I don't come across those people because everything is, you know, way and, 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 and doing fine. But it's all those other negative thoughts and feelings we have around you know why have I been given this job you know am I good enough to be doing it well you wouldn't be given it if you weren't but and so many other so many other things that go on but yes um and the impact with home as well as with um with work because all those feelings and and emotions go on at home just as much as they go on at work mm. And this is it. It's it's creating that dialogue to say that as an individual, you come with past trauma, you come you, you come with lived experience. It's yeah. not to take away from that, but also that it can be a hindrance. The, the classic is is imposter syndrome, and there's no one on this call if we were being absolutely blunt, including myself. No matter how many things and accolades you can have behind you, there will be a moment when you will have a bit of imposter syndrome and I've met some exceptional leaders who are at the top of the game and they still will say when you put them in front of a, a group of people am I the right person can I actually speak to this topic yes. so it's it's to to also look at well-being not in terms of just your your physical your um, mental your um, financial and your social but also to extend it to actually go the individual in terms of the subjective well-being so in in just layman terms, you have a high level of subjective well-being. You are a much more happier person because you've you, you've dealt with some of some of these things. When we talk about civic engagement, this is often missed out as an important key thing. And I'm going to connect this to a bit of what Gregory was talking about around the civic engagement is looking beyond when we talk about well-being in the workplace is look beyond just within the organization amongst your employees. It's also how do you participate in community dialogue, problem solving within your local community, decision making and development development within your local community. Because again, when you're giving, you actually feel a purpose. And when you feel that purpose, a lot of these other elements come into play as well. It's why, you know, why do you give to charity? You, you know, nobody's necessarily forcing you to give to charity. It's because you've your emotions have been probably strung and there's something there. But also at the same time, it's around those activities and it's not necessarily political. It's non-political in, in nature. It's the local cleanups. It's membership in community associations. It's participating in what is important in your local community. And there's a number of things, especially in Wandsworth, that potentially could create this belonging to the, to the borough in terms of how people can come together. So when people are thinking about their well-being strategies, when they're thinking about um, how do you bring well-being Think about as well this other element around civil engagement, getting people to do these things outside of work as well, like volunteering. Sorry, Gregory, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, sorry. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, I was also going to sort of like maybe add in sort of the idea of the, the trickle down effect of it all. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then so how, for example, within the work, you know, obviously because we're having a conversation and we're kind of aligning it within the workplace. So how does a work, so the question then becomes about how does a workplace then embed some of these strategies for their employers, which then in turn has a trickle down effect for maybe their families and the wider communities around them. So All somewhere right. along the line, that civil engagement becomes maybe a conversation about kind of trickle down. Um, exactly. So, yeah, I was just going to re reiterate kind of that and sort of like yeah. add that on a second as another additional point. Yeah, because the thing about well-being is it's, it's not just up to, as I said, 
previously up to just the government or just a handful of organizations. It is about the trickle effect. Um, you know, we, we're looking at well-being being beyond just an individual and a business, but also the, the world. Because as you bring back some of your well-being practices, it impacts a family, a family belongs in, in a community. And especially when we look at the, the diversity in terms of one's work, how then does it really filter out? And that's what we're trying to drive at, is that well-being is no longer just through the lens of looking at it internally. And it, it's the, the far reach. So when you invest in well-being in whatever capacity, whether it's even just having a conversation, organizing a, a local community you know event or something it, it trickles out and that's what we're trying to really drive at is not to look at well-being just through a linear lens but actually just imagine how much impact so it's not always that you can talk about it as in a return on investment it's the value on investment that you'll see as we go along and then I think that leads me on quite nicely in understanding why well-being makes commercial sense so in recent years we have seen this interlinkage between economic production, societal well-being, and then those outcomes, and then sustainability. So when we think about the Wandsworth corporate plan, which looks at 2022 to 2026, um, and I'm not going to like rattle off all the, the different things, although I have read it and I thought it's, it's quite um, thorough and it, it's really got the right focuses in line to what the trends pieces that I am seeing. It's, it's really important in, in, in the work that I do to look much, much better. It's really about building a fairer, compassionate and more sustainable borough. And this is where we talk about that investing in people, the quality of human and social. Um, it's really important to individuals, but also society. And then where we do see it, and I'll, I'll share an infographic just now and go into more de detail, is that this is where then we benefit production and company performance. And this is not only for your employees and your consumers, but also if people are happier and healthier, they're more productive and contribute to the overall firm's performance. So this is why it's important. Um, if I go on to the infographic, um, as I was talking about it, we talk about, you know, your stakeholder well-being. So often organizations will look at the organization, they'll look at the employees, but it's also to look beyond that and look at consumers. And uh, attached to that, it's also to look at your suppliers. How does everybody work together? It's how do you treat your suppliers? How do you actually engage with your suppliers? And this is why it's really well connected to what Gregory is talking about, is by opening up the dialogue in terms of the work that we're doing collectively, by understanding what the needs are at this point in time, you not only serve your consumers really well, but your employees as well, and also the wider community. We talk about product quality, its impact on consumers. Um, that's also important for their well-being of, con of consumers. But we also are then indirectly shaping the well-being of society. And then it all kind of feeds back together. So when we meet the demands for the stakeholder, we see the impact on society and the environment. We see the positive contribution to society. You then look at the sustainability element. Um, you know, there's that human capital, natural capital, economic and social, but then also you're providing accountability to shareholders and investors in maximizing financial return. So long term value is what's good for society and the planet is also good for the firm. So it's really to see it all that it is. It, it's all coming together. We, we need um, to always be feeding back in terms of this production sphere of how it all comes together. But that interlinkage between everything is what really gives us the economic production. Um, and this is how then we can measure people's well-being in relation to productivity. Um, so it's really important that we see well-being not just in terms of, okay, it's well-being, it's employees, it's that far-reaching. And then this is where the commerciality comes into play, is if we impact people, communities and business, of course, everybody wins. Uh, and we have that... Um, commerciality i'm just reading some of the comments um yeah all of this has to be done in such a way that the person does not feel exposed to others they work with feel weak um unsafe to show their feelings yes you're absolutely right lucinda and this is the reason why we talk very much when you looked at the previous slide when i talked about psychological safety and physical safety it's about creating that atmosphere of trust I see so many times that people want to create a fantastic well-being strategy. They want to go and spend the money on a great app. They want to do all of that. 
But sometimes it's about internally the culture of a business, how safe it, it, it is to open up the conversations, um, to create that atmosphere um, that I can feel that I won't be exposed. Um, I will not feel unsafe in any way if I do show my feelings. It also in, allows you to then be able to understand where people are coming from. That's really important. And, you know, for all the best um you know, initiatives you can run, and I have um, within IKEA, I run a, a successful financial well-being initiative, but I can tell you at the ground root level of delivering that, that was just the end, that was just the finish. The start came with having the the real quality conversations, the focuses, speaking to co-workers that were having trouble paying their bills because they were on, you know, short-term contracts. How am I going to make ends meet? And this was pre-pandemic and pre um, you know, cost of living crisis and people was, were struggling then, you know, what resources are available? Um, if I am in an abusive relationship, how do I get out of that if I if I can't see the end? So it's really creating that atmosphere. And that's what we're trying to, to do with some of these sessions that we're running is not to only look very centrically at just your organization and employees, but that actually you do have a far reaching impact. Um, if you want to look at it co purely commercially, then Gregory's explanation of it is there it's the fact that if you want to win new business if you want to go out for bids you do need to show what you are doing for the community and what you are doing for your employees from a well-being perspective and from a um, sustainability perspective now if you look at any major company and it's one of the tasks that you could do if when you leave here today is just go and look at the fin the latest financial um, statements from the likes of HSBC, any large company, even IKEA, you'll see now it's divided almost into three things. It will have something on the environment. So that's the ESG. Literally, that whole document now has a governance uh, area where they're showing their financials, what they've earned. So that's the governance side. They'll show a social impact. That is what we talk about well-being. It's about how you're treating new employees, how you treat your suppliers, your consumers, your customers, your communities. And then there's an environment. So this is where we talk about why we need the dialogue to open a lot more with local suppliers, opening up a lot more of the local dialogue, because there's this opportunity to work together much more um, better for the welfare of the community. So on that note, I'm going to end there and just open up a little bit more in terms of the conversation. What are our thoughts? Um, Gregory, it's a good opportunity here to perhaps for you to add on to what I've said in terms of this people, community and business element. Um, before I then end off with, with some of the resources or, or reaching out to people for support. Um yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's. I don't think I'm not sure there's that much else that I kind of wanted to add. I think it's just reiterating the same point. Um, it it is very commercial. Uh, the I guess from the perspective that I'm coming from, it is very very commercial. It is, but it is becoming more and more vital within the idea of winning a contract. Um, you know, fundamentally. You, if you wanted to win a contract from a large supplier, or from a large business, they will ask you what is your, you know, what is your ES, ESG commitments? What do they look like? And it's likely that that could win you a contract. That that ESG commitment or your health commitments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to your workplace and to your staff could just as easily win you or lose you a contract as well as the price, for example. Um, and so, yeah, I guess from, whilst I am coming from the element of it being a very, very commercial conversation or the commercial element of it, there is still a real kind of value to obviously doing this from an emotional and holistic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I guess that's really what it's all about. I, from my perspective, that's what it's all about. And that's what um, we're, I'm really, really interested in kind of supporting and promoting even further. Mm -hmm. I guess also opening it up more to, to anyone else. And I mean, please use use the chat if you're not able um, to, to you, you know, to speak up. But I'd love to hear from anyone else if there's anything else, any thoughts, any questions from your end in terms of, commerciality when we talk about well-being 
of course, there's some real terms. You know, if you save on absence and you have less people that are absent, the likelihood is that you will impact your bottom line. Um, I've seen it in large businesses as well. You know, the more productive and, and people are there and in work working, you don't have this knock on impact, which absence does have. You know, if someone is off absent, do you get someone else to to um, replace them in the interim? Or what do you need to do if they off and their work is still sitting there? So they, they are commercials just around absence in just its small entity. Um, but yeah, of course, sorry, I didn't even catch your name, the Iron Lady at Gatehouse. Hello. Uh, so there's a few of us, there's a few of us in this room, but this is um <clears throat> excuse me, a question from me. So I currently work for Space Mage and they really take well-being very seriously, um, which is really, really positive. Um, I left my previous job because of my well-being, particularly my mental well-being. Um, and but I still have a lot of friends that work for that company. So my question is sort of you know, as an employee of the company, how do you sort of encourage those in positions of power above you to understand how, you know, prioritizing well-being can make sense commercially? Obviously, mm -hmm. without them coming to this really great um, webinar, but um, yeah, what are sort of the things you can do to to promote that? Okay, no, re really good question. So the first thing is around. Um, you know, one voice is never as powerful as a collective voice. And we can just see throughout history and what has happened over the last period of time. When you collectively go through and, and you have a, a, a collective purpose, it does seem to help. The other thing is also understanding where that business is. It doesn't matter if you are a small business or medium size or a large business. At some point, the impact will be that if your people are not well, you won't have that productivity. But in answer to your specific question as to what you need to do, is I think in the first instance, if if it were me, and this is only my opinion, I can't, again, it's, it can be very subjective, but I can understand and appreciate that point because in a world where well-being, when I started out with well-being, everybody was a bit, oh, that's the fluffy stuff, isn't it? Oh my goodness, am I going to have someone? These are comments that were made to me. Oh, are they going to use mental health as the excuse now? You know, I, I encountered a lot of negative, um, you know, vibes when it came to, to well-being. And what I had to do is, is overcome that is doing a collective. So this is what we talk about your qualitative research. It's taking um, your own initiative. I guess if you if you want to take up the baton, people who work in well-being, I can tell you this much, we don't work in here because we earn big sums of money. It's because we are passionate about making a difference in the world. Our purpose is drawn to these roles because we want to see people happier and healthier. That is for sure. You know, any of the well-being leads I encounter are really it's such a tough place, but it's about taking those, you know, even if you in a small business, if there were, say, 20 people in that business and you did a um, anonymous survey with no names or anything. And you said, you know, took a couple of questions and said, these are the issues we we are collectively. I've had 20 people say these are the issues that we we are addressing. And this is impacting, you know, their sleep. It's impacting how they perform, how they, et cetera. But also what I would suggest is. And I'd like to think in any organization, identify a leader that has an invested interest. There is always one. There's always one that, you know, um, either can see that, OK, I'm siphoning money commercially, um, bottom line. This is how many people have been absent. This is it. Go and find that one leader and use that one leader to work with them to be able to move the agenda. And as I said, this isn't about saying I want an app. We want an EAP provider, we want this. It's about saying, what can we do collectively within this organization? Can we create a um, employee um, support network where we take dialogue? Um, can we do a, a once a month, you know, one hour with the, the leadership team to understand, you know, where is the business going or what what is need, you know, how does it all fit in? But I think what Gregory has also, and I'll come to you, Gregory, because you have your hand out, is actually... There's no business today, whether you're small, medium or large, that can get away from the well-being agenda. Um, there's more legislature coming through. Um, I can rattle off the ISO 45003. You know, I can rattle off the fact that there will be legislature that will force organizations to treat mental health first aiders the same as physical first aiders. There's more and more coming. So you're either going to jump on the train now and try and get with it <clears throat> or you are going to face you know down the line where it's going to be even harder for you but it's about collective you know trying to pick this battle by yourself 
is is very difficult. I guess as a as a well being lead, it's about creating that business case um, for things. But if you're not in that position and you're just taking a conversation, it's approach people as as human beings. And I think sometimes that's that's the best you can do is actually take a conversation. Um, it, it can be delicate as well. You can have certain managers that are causing well-being issues, which we do encounter. It's not uh, the likelihood of a statistic like 87% of people leave a manager rather than a, a brand or a job. We know the impact of um, people's well-being, especially when it's a, it's a leader that's not supportive of their well-being or the role that they do. Um, but definitely start off small. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Try and identify that one leader that has a, a soft spot almost. It's usually something that they have interest in. Um, it's either that they've got a, a child that has neurodiversity, for example, or um, has a, a mental health uh, issue or is going through perimenopause or, or menopause or alternatively a, a man whose wife is going through menopause or he's he's had burnout experience. There's always something you can pick out. Um, and I think it starts small. Um, great things have never, you know, happened just overnight. It does take some time. I don't know if that was any helpful, but I think that's where I would say is this employee support creates the ones that want to. When people put their hands up, they put their hands up. I've seen it time and time again. If you sent out just a message, you know, on Teams and said, guys, you know, lunchtime, half an hour, is there anybody that would be interested in in talking about well-being or learning more about well-being or wanting to get that group together because that group collectively can put something to leaders to say we think this is important so not doing it by yourself uh, um, Gregory? sorry uh, yeah I, I was just gonna add i was just add on to that like um like so there's been so like recently recently there was like conversations in the news about um the number like like the number of sick days that people take off mm -hmm. and like whether we should change sort of like um sick pay legislation in line with maybe other european countries that are not that are a little bit more amenable to sort of like the concept of sick pay um and then there was arguments for and against it um, and I was just bringing it up to that point to the, to sort of obviously to the question from the uh, from the gatehouse. You know, like I I almost think that there's elements of having this conversation with HR on whether some of these things can be embedded within HR processes. I think that there's um, to maybe consider that even as simple. I know with certain companies, obviously, a lot of certain companies like to do. Um, you know, whether it's an away day, whether it's a staff day, whether it's a half day doing sort of like some sort of exercise at work, it's those like little moments that potentially you could maybe embed, whether it was, I don't know, an after, I've been, I've worked in places where they've done, you know, after work yoga classes and it was all paid for by, you know, by the company, for example. You know, the, the bigger companies might have sort of like an in-house gym, or things like that, but it could be as simple as doing that after work mm. yoga class. Um, so I just wanted to kind of add that into it as well. Like it has been a conversation. So from a commercial perspective, there's conversations about the idea of, as we've talked about before, you know, sickness, taking yeah. time off work, how it financially impacts your staff team. You yeah. know, there's so yeah, there's some other things maybe to think about with that as well. Yeah, I mean, if they if they want figures, I mean, <laughs> for sure we we can we can give them how, how much time do you have because yeah, I, I and and please you know I'll be leaving my details as well. If you want to connect, if you want to have a conversation, please just you know um, just let us know. But I mean, it, it's facts like what Gregor was talking about. I mean, it's it costs the you know we are one of the worst that you know Great Britain has the worst health in Europe, uh, and we're putting an immense strain on on the NHS. But it's estimated. It's 185.6 million working days were lost because of sickness uh, or injury in 2022. Um, you know, and it's it's a it's it's costing our economy 15 billion pounds a year in sickness. So you know, if they if they want the facts and figures, you know, you have a percentage of that. And and this is when I talk about a business case. But it's really difficult when you're taking that first step. The first step is about getting people together because the minute you go in with we want money for X, Y, and Z chances are they won't listen to you. 
what you have to put it on its head is okay this is the scenario we know you know ill health costs but in our business this is where we are these are, are the issues we're facing with well-being this is what we want to try and do because not only that if we just think even of mental health and where people are at the moment the immense strain they under um we've gone from the pandemic and everybody's sort of forgotten about it haven't they they almost gone p- pandemic what back we on this like all mice on this like running you know wheel uh we've forgotten that actually we were brought to our knees with a pandemic and that's really essential um but i'm i'm going to end there because i'm conscious of of everyone's time i could speak about this the whole day but we don't have the whole day so please reach out if there's anything there's some useful links that i've i've left behind um you know i would encourage as well if you are looking at um the wandsworth healthy places it gives you a really um good way of um kind of setting out in terms of what you could be focusing on um it gives you a good start for six when you're thinking of your well-being strategy as well um if you if you're not there at the moment um gregory's um information as well is in the chat but i've also put it here it's around that business and licensing procurement supply wandsworth if you want to learn more about that my linkedin is there please feel free to connect if you need any extra uh, information or any further resources and then there's also a link to let's improve workplace wellbeing um and then i'll hand it over to nadal just to finish us off thanks nurs that was really great thank you everybody for attending and the rich discussions i think it really opened up quite a lot of interesting topics and areas and the conversation doesn't end here this is a series and we are uh, we've got a, another one planned in september i've gotten the date nurs um yeah it's at the end of uh, september it's, it's uh, at the end of the yeah. september um yeah. and um that's going to be around mental health um and uh, the public health team are looking at how we can also support local businesses more so if you've got any thoughts and ideas please do share um, you can contact me directly go to the council webpage um, and, and speak to NUS as well